So my major in, as an undergraduate and as a graduate student, was political science. And so my field of study was political theory. And so the first class that you have to take in both of those, either as an undergrad or a graduate, starts out telling you about Plato, who, while he thinks democracy is okay, believes we would be better ruled by philosopher kings. And then they move on from there through the philosophers that, especially in the political science department, have something to say. And one of them that they get to in this, this progression that I had to do three times was Machiavelli. I don't know how many of you have ever had to read Machiavelli, but you know who Machiavelli is, right? Because he argued that the prince should do whatever it takes, whenever it takes to maintain power, right? He should do everything he needs to to consolidate power. He can be as vicious and as mean and as cruel as he wants. Now some believe that Machiavelli just wrote this because his life was in danger and he just needed to get along with the king so he could have his job. But for whatever reason Machiavelli wrote this, he wrote about the dangers of kings, the troubles with kings. Although he was writing it on the side of the king, right? This is what you can do to really consolidate power and be a good king. The rest of us read it and go, this is the danger of kings. Right? Sort of like the video I showed you at the beginning was incredibly fun, right? Simba is romping through the world saying he can't wait to be a king. And why can't he wait to be a king? Because then he can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, with nobody telling him what to do. The trouble with kings. In 1 Samuel 8, we get to the point in Israel's history where they demand a different type of leadership. When they were freed from the king, the pharaoh, and moved through the wilderness and into the promised land, they didn't have a king. Instead, their king was God. The ruler was God. The person who told them how to live their lives, how to govern, how they dealt with each other, how they should be towards their neighbors and each other, to their family, who told them what it meant to be an Israelite. And when they ran into trouble, God would give them a judge. Someone who could lead the armies in battle against the neighbors who were encroaching. And during that time, we learn that the Israelites slowly but surely forgot who God was. Forgot what God had done. Turned away from God. And so we get to Samuel, the last of the judges, and while Samuel is raised up because the person before him is corrupt, we learn now that Samuel is old and at the end of his life that his sons, too, are corrupt. That they have taken bribes. That they have done things that are not the way it should be done. And so the people cry out for a king. And Samuel hears their cry for a king, and he gets upset, angry. And so he talks to God. He asks God, what should I do about this call for a king? And God tells him, Samuel, it's not about you. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. And so I want you to give them what they want. But I want you to tell them about the trouble of kings. I think this passage is a passage that speaks to us today as much as it spoke to the people thousands of years ago. 
Because if we look at the world right now, we see the rise of kings. We don't call them kings anymore. We call them dictators or authoritarian leaders. But we've seen them arise in Hungary, in Turkey, in different states in Africa and Central and South America, where people, the person in charge, and his army of followers consolidate power and do what they want. Among the things that they do is they shut down the free press so that all you hear in that country is what they want you to hear. They take over the judiciary so that all the rules that are decided are the rules that only benefit the leader and his party. So why do we, or why has the world turned towards this? I think that's part of what we, when we look to our scriptures, we ask that same question. Why did the people want a king? What was it in their lives that demanded a king? I think one of the things we can see is they weren't feeling secure. They weren't feeling safe. They wanted someone who would come in and protect them. They had been in the chapters between last week's sermon and this week's sermon. It's a battle with the Philistines. They lose their holiest of holies. They lose the Ark of the Covenant. It's stolen from them. And so they aren't feeling safe. And the desire is to feel safe and secure. To feel that they are protected. And so they demand a king. Because they had other options, right? When they say, we want a king because your sons are corrupt and you are old, they could have said, just give us a new judge, right? We don't want your sons. They didn't ask for a new judge. They looked at their neighbors, the nations around them, to see which of them felt the most secure. And in the nation that they felt were the most secure, they had a king. And so they demand a king. But God and Samuel tell them about the trouble of kings. When you call out for a king, this is what you are going to get. You're going to get a king who will take your sons and in, put them into the military, right? I mean, they talk about chariots and um, bands. The people who will be with the king in those divisions. And they will take your daughters, and they prescribe three jobs that the daughters will get. And then they will take the best of your lands, because now it won't be your land, it will be the king's land. And they will take your servants and your slaves, so that they can work that land. And then on top of having already taken the best, the best of your cattle and your land and your vineyards. They will then, on top of that, demand 10% of everything that you produce. And so Samuel lays it all out that if you really want a king, here are the things that happen. Here's what it means. And I wonder what we would say about that. What does it mean today to have an authoritarian leader? What does it look like if you have someone who rules us in that same manner? I mean, one of the things we know is it means truth becomes the truth that the king says, not the truth that is objectively true. We know that it means that you no longer have a right to any and all ideas. 
you get to know the ideas that I want for you. And it often means violence, right? In any of those countries that have chosen a dictatorship or an authoritarian leader, the people who disagree with them disappear. They disappear into prisons. They just disappear, meaning that they are probably dead and will never be seen again. And they tamp down on anything that disagrees with them. And in that moment, we can understand how in a world that seems chaotic and lost, how you desire something that brings security and safety, that makes you feel protected. When you feel like your world is crumbling and it's no longer the way it has been, that desire for safety makes sense. But I think what they missed, because you know when preachers and people talk to you a lot and they get to that last line, the one that's the most important, you've already gone on to whatever you're thinking about in your head and aren't listening anymore. And the last line was, and that day that you choose this, the day that you need me, God, I won't be there. Now, I will tell you that God says that, but God changes God's mind, right? Because God continues to show up through the rest of the books of the Bible. But for a while there, when they cry out for God, God is silent because they have rejected God. When we read this passage, and we see this in our own lives, it makes us think. Like this morning as I was driving to church, because I always have NPR on, it was playing on the media. And this week on On the Media, they asked the question about what do you do about corrupt leaders? What happens in different countries when there are corrupt leaders? Which is a question that has faced us. I mean, we think about that because before Queen Elizabeth died, she had just anointed the new prime minister because the old prime minister was thrown out of office because of corruption. But he isn't the only one. We can look in the news and see corruption everywhere we turn. The Israelis are prosecuting their former prime minister for corruption. In our country, what does corruption look like? And do we punish them for it? I think about this a lot because every time there's something that I'm excited about that will make the lives of people better, it usually fails or gets cut down to be really small and then we learn that the people who voted no, right, took this amount of money from oil companies or this amount of money for pharmacies or this amount of money from whoever was opposed to that idea, right? And while we don't call that corruption, it sure seems like every time they get dumped a lot of money, all of a sudden that idea that could have made all of our lives better is now long, no longer the idea that passes into law. And so it makes it understandable why there are people in our country who want what would be safe and secure. What would make them feel as if things haven't changed so much that it doesn't make sense anymore. And yet we're turning to the wrong things, right? We've forgotten that last line, or even the first line, that they aren't rejecting you, they're rejecting God. And this I have really struggled with this week because I get very concerned about Christian nationalism 
Meaning that the way they think about who we are to be as Christians isn't what I read in the Gospels, right? They aren't concerned with the issues that I see from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible about taking care of the poor, the widows, the orphans, the immigrants. The issues that they fight for in Christian nationalism isn't about how are we going to care for our neighbors? How are we going to make sure that people have food and clothing and water and houses? But I want to tell you that what God asks us to do is to remember the covenant. To remember that God has promised to be with us for God's love to surround us. And when we do, when we believe and trust in those promises, when we believe and trust in the word, life is better. We're invited to trust God and know that God will be present with us when the troubles come, whether they be a king or a president, that God will be with us when the troubles come. And that we're to remember that safety and security comes when we emulate Jesus. When we think about what it means to actually follow what Jesus told us. And that's the hardest part, right? Because how many of you, when you read through the Sermon of the Mount, go, Oh, oh, that's a lot. That's a lot. You really want me to love my enemies? You really want me to turn the other cheek? You really want me to think about the world differently? To think about how those who have been hurt the most are the ones that God blesses the most? And yet that's who we're called to follow, right? That's who we're called to trust in. That's how we are supposed to feel secure and safe. When we truly believe that we're to love one another, that we are to love our enemies, that love is what is to bind us together. That as we choose our kings or politicians, those who rule over us, do we ask that question? Do we ask them how they follow? or how they believe we take care of our neighbors, we take care of the least of these? Is that the question you ask? I think that's a good question for us to think about. As this season of elections comes around, and I look at things and I don't know what to vote for, right? Proposition 27 has me stymied because each side has made a really good case, and usually you can figure out which side will be most helpful. And this one is hard. But if we ask that question, how is this about loving our neighbors, loving each other? Which side do we fall on when we make those decisions? The trouble with kings. It's a perennial problem with no solution. But we can choose differently. God has invited us since he freed the Israelites from Egypt to choose a different way, a different path. A path that sets us apart from the world we are part of. That thinks about the things differently that is concerned about our neighbors, that is concerned about those who are least and last and lost. May we learn to trust in God. Amen.